Clarity on Fire, a podcast for people who know what they don't want out of their life and career, but aren't sure what they'd rather be doing. In a world where it's easy to exist, but hard to feel alive, we, Kristen and Rachel, two certified life and career coaches, are here to help you cut through the information overload, get unstuck, and focus not just on how you can have a career you're passionate about, but how to create a whole life that feels fulfilling. So join us here, where we serve up inspiration and down-to-earth wisdom in a way that only two best friends can. We want you to experience the relief of knowing that, yes, you're allowed to want more out of your life and career. And no, you don't have to wander through the dark anymore. Our job is to light the fire that shows you the way. Let's go. Okay, we're back with another bonus book club. We haven't had one in a while. It's about time. Well, there is a logical reason why this (laughs) happens. It's only three or four times a year. You get five Fridays in a month instead of four, which is why we're doing this. It's everything to do with the calendar and and not us. (laughs) Yeah, sorry for those of you who want more book clubs, but this is why we do it. So before we jump in, I want to quickly say, and I'll, I'll talk more about this at the end too, but... Next week, Kristen and I are going to be interviewed on an interview series that you guys might want to look out for. And so there's a link to register for it in the episode description. It's actually called the Clarity Course Series, which is funny, kind of synchronous. How to Handle Doubt, Get Unstuck, and Live Your Purpose. This is hosted by um, Caroline Garnett McGraw, who's an author and a speaker and a fellow INFJ, if that matters to to you. (laughs) And she's brought together a bunch of people on various subjects. And a couple that I think are interesting sounding are one about how to harness your spiritual intuition. So why we get disconnected, the first step to reconnect, and then how to get still when you have a monkey mind and you want to meditate, which is something that I always want to do and try to do and then can't do. So there's also one about saying no and living on purpose, why so many women are stuck and overwhelmed and how the speaker got out, and how to determine what is and isn't a fit for your life, and how to uncommit, which is very related. Both of those things are related to what we're about to talk about, which is why they stood out to me. So this series sounds like something that is going to be relevant to all of you. And so our interview is going to air on June 4th. We're the last in the series, so you could access ours and all of the ones that came before it for three days starting on June 4th. So if you're like, I love free speaker stuff, why not? Let's check some of this out. I mean, it's free. What do you have to lose? Right. You should do it. Go to the, Sign up. Go to the episode description and you'll see the link to register for that. Okay. And I'll remind you, we'll remind you about that on Tuesday as well, because that'll be the day it comes out. So, okay. okay. Today, we are talking about a really fascinating book called Dodging Energy Vampires. An Empath's Guide to Evading Relationships That Drain You and Restoring Your Health and Power. If you've never heard this term, By Christian energy, Northrup, medical yes, doctor. Yes, we, we need to give Dr. Her. Christian Northrup. Credit where credit is due. If you've never heard this term, energy vampire, we're going to do a deep dive into what that actually means in a little bit. But I guarantee you, you know someone who is an energy vampire just because... Statistically, there's so many of them out there. So we're going to get into what that actually means. You might have an idea just from the title. But first, we want to talk about who are the types of people who might be prone to having these kinds of relationships in the first place? Yeah, like (laughs) uh, there's a certain type of person who always attracts energy vampires. Kristen is one of them. I am the human form of garlic. I'm very proud of that. (laughs) Um, And I've... I read this book and it was so fascinating because I could just see when I was reading it, I was just like seeing all of the past interactions you've had with people and how it was like checking all these boxes of of how I've seen you interact with people and how people have preyed upon you yep. and why that's pissed me off so much. <laughs> so yeah, I specific, learned a lot. Specific people certainly came to mind and it made a lot of sense. I was yeah. able to realize, oh, that's why... That relationship was so unbalanced and so draining. And these can be people in your family. This can be friends, coworkers, romantic relationships. It could be anyone that you interact with. It doesn't just have to be in a romantic setting necessarily or just in a work setting. Uh, These people will find you anywhere. 
So, okay, we're going to talk about recognizing yourself, why you as an empath or highly sensitive, which is what we're going to get into in a second, are incredibly tasty to energy vampires, how to recognize an energy vampire, how to deal with an energy vampire, and then how to heal from your relationship with an energy vampire. It is a lot. All the ground. So buckle up. This is going to be a long and potentially whirlwind experience, but I think you're all going to be the much better for having had it at the end of Keep this. in mind, we can't go into every single aspect yeah, of this. You, you could can just go read, read the, the book. book. Yeah, <laughs> you can just do that. Okay, so I'm going to read the first two paragraphs of the introduction because I think it'll say it better than we could. So, if you found this book, it's likely you have a sneaking suspicion that one of your relationships isn't 100% healthy. It could be a relationship with a parent, a spouse, a coworker, a sibling, a child, or anyone else you spend a good amount of time with. You may love and respect this person, but every time you're with them, you come away feeling a little crazy. You may also feel drained, depleted, tired, like the energy has literally been sucked out of you. If this sounds familiar, it's likely that you are in a relationship with someone who is commonly known as an energy vampire. People who fall into this personality category feed off of the energy of the people around them. The other thing that's likely is that just like the energy vampire, you also have a personality type. Tell me if any of this sounds familiar. You go somewhere and find yourself suddenly feeling sad or angry for no apparent reason. Perhaps you know immediately after settling in at a movie theater or concert that you have to sit somewhere else. Or perhaps someone who seems happy leaves you feeling extraordinarily sad. Maybe you feel drawn to the healing arts and the study of things like astrology and energy medicine, but feel like you can't tell anyone about it because they'll think you're crazy. Perhaps you're not so sure that you're worthy enough to deserve love and attention without earning them through acts of service. If you can relate to anything like this, or if you've simply been told that you're too sensitive, it's likely that you are part of a special group of individuals called empaths or highly sensitive people. We have an entire podcast episode about highly sensitive people yeah. that we will link to in yes. this episode. Because I guarantee you, if you're resonating with the concept of energy vampires, you're probably also highly sensitive or an empath. And we want to talk a little bit about empaths here in particular, because we didn't get as much into that well, side of things. I'm actually just, in this book, I think she uses those two terms interchangeably. And I will say that they are different. A highly sensitive person has a ton of empathy. An empath is someone who is maybe even more highly sensitive on the scale. Like there when may it be comes the to people feeling other people's energy yes. and feelings. So we're gonna use them interchangeably. They're very, very related. A lot of overlap. For A sure. lot of overlap. And you don't have to focus too hard on it. We just want you to listen to the description of what we're gonna give of empaths and highly sensitives. And if any of it resonates with you, that's what matters. Yes. Who cares so, what we call it? <laughs> so empaths are what we call porous. Which just means that they end up taking on other people's energy, emotions, thoughts, and they actually start to mistake it for their own. So because of that, there's this weird thing that happens where an empath feels like they don't know where they end and the other person begins. They start to merge with other people because they take on their feelings so intensely. And sometimes you don't know, am I feeling stressed? Or am I feeling someone else's stress? It's actually difficult to discern the difference. Porous like a sponge. That's yes. why she uses the word porous. So they also suffer when other people suffer. Um, this is a direct quote from the book that I liked. If an empathic, creative, energetic child is born into a family that values logic and study, the child will soon become subdued and work to prove her worth through family-approved pursuits. They don't do this consciously. It's a survival mechanism. Because they're so attuned to other people's energy, they suffer when others suffer, and they work hard not to make anyone suffer. Therefore, also the dog is barking. She's here. (laughs) Damn her hide. She does not give a crap about anyone else's feelings. She has no tolerance for energy vampires either. (laughs) Yeah, we love her for that. Um, So you can imagine that if you are an empath who feels other people's energy and you feel negativity around you, you would want to do as much as you possibly could to try to avoid that, which means you often try not to rock the boat. You might say yes when you actually want to say no, just to keep things smooth. You want to do anything you you can to not experience 
negativity because first of all, you're so sensitive to it. And second of all, you're feeling everyone's negativity, not just your own. So you're more likely to end up being a peacekeeper and placating. Like a mediator, smoothing things over. And so you end up taking on extra work. You're listening to everyone's stuff. You're trying to help. You're trying to be supportive because you think when you can make someone else feel better, when you can uplift them, it will make you feel better because now you're not picking up on their stuff. Yeah. So you're very like sacrificial with your energy and with your time and just with your emotions because you figure if I can just smooth everything over and I can make everyone happy, then I don't have to feel unhappy because everyone else is unhappy or everyone else is negative. And it's self-protective. It makes sense when you think of it like that. I want to also throw out there that if you feel like you resonate with this description of an empath, Christian Northrup recommends a book called The Empath Survival Guide by Judith Orloff. So that will help you. Judith Orloff. That's quite I, a name. I'm, I'm a little bit uh, stuffy. I'm not too, making so fun of you. I'm just saying. It didn't come out as clearly as it would have, but <laughs> it's, just, it's just a mouthful. It is a mouthful, especially when you're having some allergies. Um so that might help you give a little, get a little bit more insight into what it means to be an empath. And then combine that with our highly sensitive podcast. You can get a really in-depth sense of what the characteristics of these kind of people are. I'll link to that book in the episode description as well. Anything that we mention podcast-wise or book-wise, I'll link to. If so we want to make it easy for find you it. to go find that. Okay. So that's a pretty brief description of what it means to be an empath, but I think that you will have recognized yourself in that if you feel like you are a highly sensitive or you are an empath. I will pause and say, I didn't mean to talk about this, but you are definitely the kind of person she's describing in this book. You mean me? Yes. Yes. (laughs) I'm highly sensitive, but I'm not the person she's describing in this book. And we're going to talk about how she actually has a sentence. I wish I'd written it down, but I didn't about why there are people who are highly sensitive who are not at all victims susceptible susceptible to energy vampires. And we're going to get into that. And so I'll make a point of addressing that because some of you might be like, yeah, I'm highly sensitive, but these people never take advantage of me. So why is that? So we'll talk about that. So, okay. Ooh, I'm getting into my favorite part now. (laughs) How, How you guys, empaths, highly sensitives, become prey like for energy vampires. So the traits that make empaths different create a great deal of emotional pain. So think about this. Your differences are often attacked or misunderstood by your family or by society. You've probably been told that you're crazy or that you're weird or that you're too sensitive, which leads you to feel anxious, self-doubting, and it leads to an inability to trust your own judgment about anything. So (laughs) because you're feeling all this doubt and inner turmoil, in order to be accepted, you feel like I've got to bend myself into a pretzel to fit in and to get love and acceptance from my family, from my friends, from my peers. And in order to do that, you have to numb out your own sensitivity, your intuition, your discernment. You have to cut those parts off from yourself because those are not going to allow you to be accepted. Mm -hmm. And instead, you focus on getting the approval of others because again, when everything is harmonious, it feels better for you. Which means an energy vampire is going to use that against you. Oh, yeah. They're going to, that is... They know you want love and acceptance from others, and they will use that as a manipulation tactic. That and they can smell a mile away. I don't know how they do it. They can smell a mile away a person who doesn't have an ability to discern. It's because, and we'll get into this when we get into the section about energy vampires, but they have a specific kind of intuition that allows them to clue in to that sense of needing acceptance and love from this others. sort of neediness and goodness and, and they use naivete in, of, of like the traditional person who gets preyed upon. They have a good intuition. They just use it in, for corrupt means. Yeah. Okay. So another reason that highly sensitive and, and empaths become prey is because they radiate a strong amount of compassion and understanding energy, which is very attractive to people. Not just energy vampires. It's attractive to everyone. They believe... Okay. <laughs> This is this is my this favorite. Is, this is yep. This is this the is difference me, between you and 100%. me right here. They also believe in the inherent goodness of people, and that deep down, everyone can and wants to change. So they often make excuses for people who don't deserve it. Raising my hand, literally raising my hand. This. So when Christian said, 
the highly sensitives who aren't prey, this is the difference. There are highly sensitives who know that not everyone means well and that not everyone is inherently a good person and that you shouldn't trust everyone, which is me. I'm like, I'm a highly sensitive and I don't trust everybody. I, I'm skeptical as hell about people's intentions <laughs> and it hasn't misled me, right? Well, and then, so this is what happens. And I can tell you this from personal experience. When you believe everyone is inherently good, but they may be broken or they may ha- may be hurt from their and past. They just or, change and, and they everyone, of course, would want to be better. Why wouldn't they want to be better? Then you feel this desire to heal to help or them. fix them because you can see their potential. Now, that may not actually actually exist. <laughs> no, it might not. But <laughs> and they can... might not have any interest in meeting their potential. And in which case, it's a moot point. But you can see it and you say, I know that this person has good in them. I know that this person can heal from what happened to them. And because you feel so intensely and you so want that love and belonging, you will do what it takes to try to help them heal from that. Yeah. Which is a nice thought. But when it comes to an energy vampire, completely misplaced. So, right. So when you believe in someone's goodness and inherent desire to change even when the evidence does not support it, (laughs) you end up idealizing people and the relationships you're in in ways that are not realistic, they're not healthy, and it means you are completely ignoring, sometimes blatantly ignoring red flags that other people are easily picking up on, which is one of the biggest problems you and I have ever had in our entire (laughs) relationship are all the red flags I've told you you are ignoring about people or that you don't see and that you just couldn't see. Yes, I... I literally could not see them. And it was, I thought she was lying. I was like, you are in denial. There's no freaking way you can't see this. It is so obvious No, because I I can see the good. And so that's what I focus on. Well, what you, good you often made up. Sometimes, yes. Right? Yes. And that's that's a, that's a uh, hazard of being rose-colored glasses. Absolutely. Yeah. So this is what happens when these types of people, empaths and highly sensitives are in relationship they very often take on too much responsibility within the relationship. So they so want to win the love and support and acceptance, and they do that through service and sacrifice, they will overgive it in an attempt to get in return the acceptance and love, which means they're often giving 75% or more in a relationship. And if they just get 25% back, they're, I think in the book she actually says they feel like they have reached relationship nirvana. Right. When someone if is giving them twenty five percent, someone's like lifting to their seventy five singular finger, and they're like beside themselves because <laughs> because to them because so many empaths and highly sensitives are starved for love and affection because a they have such a high capacity to feel, and b so many of them have been rejected and misunderstood that they're craving it even more that they become such easy prey because there's their bar becomes too low for what is acceptable in a relationship or from another person. It doesn't have to be romantic. You know, it can be someone, a friend putting in their 50% or a a family member, you know, your father, your mother giving their half of the relationship and, you know, not expecting you to come 90% of the way. So you can see from these characteristics we've described why these people would be, these people, I should say me, (laughs) my kind of people would be more susceptible than other people to being manipulated, to oh, being taken it is advantage the perfect of. Perfect storm, right? Like yes. you're kind, you're compassionate, you genuinely want to believe in the goodness of people. You're gonna and, overgive, you're gonna try to help and heal and fix. And you're blatantly shutting down your own intuition sometimes. You're ignoring red flags. I mean, it's the perfect, you're the perfect mark for an energy vampire. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> so so let's get into what an energy vampire actually is and how to recognize these people. Okay, so first things first, energy vampirism (laughs) is on a spectrum. So there are people on the lower end of the spectrum who are maybe not technically energy vampires, but they're what she calls inadvertent energy drainers. Like they don't know exactly that they're doing it, but they are draining to be around and they have some qualities of an energy vampire. And then there are, on the opposite end of the spectrum, full-fledged vampires with personality disorders that are diagnosable. So there's your sociopaths, your psychopaths, your narcissists, your borderline personality disorders, and all of that. So it doesn't really matter where a particular vampire is on the spectrum. What matters is that they all have a couple of big things in common, 
they are manipulative, very much so, specifically for personal gain. And that can come through in covert, sometimes overt, aggressive behavior. Yeah, right. I think she uses the word covert aggression because energy vampires are really, really good at not being obvious about how much they're manipulating people. At least it will start out being more covert. It might become more overt over time once you're more invested in the relationship. Yeah. But at first they know how to do it very kind of beating around the bush. Yeah. And they're not interested in change too. This is another point that I'm probably made somewhere else, but it's just coming up for me right now is that, again, it doesn't matter where they are on the spectrum. If someone is open to feedback, they're likely not an energy vampire. Energy vampires are completely uninterested in change and they are completely unwilling to change. And very likely they feel like there's nothing wrong with them. So let me pause right now and answer the question that some of you are worried about, which is hilarious. Some of the empaths listening to this <laughs> think that they are energy vampires or they oh are gosh, worried. Am I an energy vampire? No, That's if some you're of you... asking it, you're not an energy vampire because <laughs> energy vampires are very, very predisposed to not do any introspection. They an don't energy vampire know. could listen to this entire podcast and walk away saying, wow, those crazy energy vampires out there <laughs> yeah. not identify at all no. with it because yeah. they're not introspective at all. They don't want to take blame for their responsibility. They're half no. of it. They will always put that outside of themselves. They'll foist it on anybody but themselves. Yep. You can think of people in your life and we'll have you make a list later of the people in your life or celebrities or <clears throat> presidents um, <laughs> who might be energy vampires. So you can tell that you're not because you're open and minded to change and growth and feedback and you're willing to hear difficult things if it's in the interest of your own growth. Yeah. So So these energy vampires, these people are mostly born, not made. As in, it's not just because of their bad childhood. That that didn't make them an energy vampire. A tragic backstory is not an excuse for manipulative behavior. And this is so yes. hard for empaths. Oh, you want to make yes. it an excuse so badly. That's why I put this bullet in here is because I think it's so important for empaths to realize that energy vampires can't often be fixed because it's not some experience that can be turned around in order to make them better. Plenty of people have tragic childhoods who do not become energy vampires. Right. That is not a cause. It is literally a brain miswiring often. It is a problem that even medication and therapy, we're going to talk about this later, completely doesn't work on that. Medication might, I suppose, balance out certain personality disorders, but it is often like something that they just are, not something that you can fix because they turned into it. They were just born that way. Christian Northrup is a medical doctor and she, so she understands the more medical side of what's going on here. And she does give a little bit more insight in the book into what's going on in their brain, how yeah. their brains are actually wired differently. Yeah. And this is important for empaths to know because you It's need not to in know, your power to change you someone's brain wiring. You can't change their brain wiring. Right. Just like you were born an empath and you didn't become an empath. Exactly. They were born a vampire. They didn't become a vampire. Therefore, they can't really change it. Just like you can't change being a highly sensitive person. It's just who you are. Yes. It's how they are. I wanted to add in this statistic <laughs> yeah. because I want you to know how common this is. About 20% of people have some vampire characteristics. Now, remember, it's a spectrum. We're not saying 20% of people are psychopaths, but we are saying that 20% of people land somewhere in that spectrum. No, but she did say, I think, 1 in 20 or 25 in the book. I don't have it written down, is a psychopath. Literally 1 in 25 people is a psychopath. That means one student in most classrooms. Is, now that doesn't mean they're literal. They're a literal serial killer. That's, I right, think most you're going to murder people <laughs> who technically qualify as psychopaths don't actually become murderers or serial rapists or something. But that means that they are likely energy vampires. And so, if twenty percent of people have vampiric characteristics, that means that one in every five people you interact with is an energy, an energy vampire to some degree. Which means you've got at least one in your family. Probably That's why I more said than one. At the beginning of this episode, you know someone. You've that, got the stats in, are too right. high. You've you got them at someone. work. You've got them in your friend group. You've got them in your family and extended family. Like you've got them everywhere. So it's important to realize how just how ubiquitous it is, so that you don't think you're crazy. Because again, an empath, they'll take on other people's energy and they'll feel insane. And when you realize how common this is, you realize, oh my God, I'm interacting with people like this all the time. And I'm wondering what's wrong with me. There's nothing wrong with you. There's just a lot of people 
who are manipulative and have not a lot of desire to change and who are completely draining everyone else's energy. So we said this, you can recognize them because they have no interest in changing or growing. They will make you feel wrong if you call them out and they do not take responsibility for anything. They do not own their shit. Nope. And then on top of that, this is what we were getting into before. They have a malignant intuition. I love this phrase. I love it too. It's a sixth sense about the wounds of an empath. So they actually are very intuitive, but in this really corrupt way. So they know exactly what an empath most longs to hear. If that empath did not feel accepted as a child, they will make them feel accepted. If they didn't feel loved, they will love bomb them until the empath feels like, oh, Finally, this person really gets me. That's this person gets those sees hooks me. In you. And so they'll start out with all of this love and affection and they'll come on really, they're very charismatic. So they can use that to reel you in. So I love this. The, the, another phrase she uses is they feed off of something called narcissistic supply, which is mm-hmm. basically them diverting and directing energy, attention, and money toward themselves at all times. Like everything has to get back to them. Every conversation turns back to them. Every amount of energy has to be diverted toward them. The money has to turn toward them. You see this in corrupt politicians and leaders and celebrities. Like, just, you can, you know energy vampires. Yes. Almost they will, easier from afar than you can from close up, yeah. I think. They will bleed you dry of energy, of money, of resources. They're a black hole of neediness. Yep. Like, it's never it, enough. It's never enough. There's never a point where a black hole says, I have absorbed enough matter. Or dark never. matter or whatever the hell a black hole is up to. <laughs> I don't know. It just keeps sucking and sucking and sucking. It's never, ever going to be enough. I want you to think of this as a parasite on yes. leached onto you, stealing your energy. So you can imagine if you are someone who is being preyed upon by a vampire, you can very often experience physical health issues. Yes, because your life force is just being drained constantly, which is a major source of stress. And exhaustion. Your body is literally fatigued all the time, which leads it to break down. So as a medical doctor who has worked with a lot of women in her practice, Christian Northrup says there are a series of diseases that she sees very often from people who are experiencing In a long-term relationship with an energy vampire. So that could look like adrenal fatigue, Lyme disease, thyroid disorders, an inability to lose weight, IBS, diabetes, breast cancer, and other autoimmune and what we call mystery illnesses that you don't really understand where it's coming from that don't tend to respond well to conventional medicine because it's not, that's that's not the cause of it. your physical body isn't what's causing it. It's your energetic body that's causing it. Exactly. So we're not saying those illnesses are always caused by an energy vampire. No, but she said that she really believes that about, I think, 75% of the women she worked with, when she traced back, when she asked about their relationship patterns, she would find an energy vampire leeching them in some place or another that was causing these long-term health issues. So it's a chronic, it's a health catastrophe. It's like a national crisis, Mm -hmm. energy vampirism, because so many people have them in their lives and are being affected without realizing just how badly it could be impacting your your physical well-being, not to mention your mental, spiritual, emotional well-being. I want to remind you now, (laughs) these people cannot be fixed. Therapy does not work on them. The reason why is because they need to be willing to change. And these people are just not willing to change. They don't see anything wrong with themselves. They don't want to do the hard work. They don't want to do any self-reflection. They don't want to do any personal growth. They just want to leech off of your energy. Yeah. That's it. So... Just to give you a few more flags to be on the lookout for. They are often very charming and good looking and charismatic and outgoing. They're not necessarily, they don't look evil necessarily. They can be really, They can be the life of the party. They can look really fun. They can seem really loving and charming. But they also have a, they can also be really ambitious and have a disregard for right and wrong. They can be fixated on material gain. They tend to minimize and lie and tell half-truths easily bored and very fixated on pot stirring and melodramas and they can be hypersexual and very seductive Mm -hmm. because they want to draw you in yep and they do they hook you in usually with a sob story about oh my life is so hard or my past is so hard or this terrible thing just happened to me and as an empath you just want to swoop right in and embrace them in your loving 
protective energy and heal them. And they know that. They know that. So they will prey upon your compassion, knowing that you're a sucker for a sob story because you feel so much. It's a really great quality and they try to warp it. So, okay. One last major list I want to read you from the book directly about evaluating the people in your life. She says, okay. And these are their manipulation tactics. Yeah. So she says, when you're looking at your relationships and your interactions with someone you suspect could be a vampire, look for the use of these common manipulation tactics. Being aggressive or covertly aggressive to get their own way. The need to always win. They won't take no for an answer. And if you resist, they wear you down until you give up. Lies that portray them in the best light, no matter what the situation or their real part in it. Super competitiveness and fighting for the upper hand, making sure to always display their power. No straight answers, even to a simple question. For example, they might answer the question, can I count on you to pick up the groceries tonight with, you know how tired I get after work. Mm -hmm. Blaming others for their own hurtful actions and laying on guilt trips in order to make you feel bad. Yes. If any of those sound familiar, we want you to take a closer look (laughs) at that relationship. (laughs) Okay. So now I think it's time. Hopefully you are starting to recognize these things. You might have some people coming to mind. So what do you do when you interact with these people? We're going to talk about dealing. How do you deal with these people when they are in your life? First thing you have to do is you have to admit that there's a problem. Okay. And I'm going to add this in because this is the part that I've been angry about for years that I've been on my soapbox about and I feel the need to say it, which is accept that there are people who are not filled with light and love, who don't mean well, and who suck and don't want to change. Not everyone is a good person. Stop assuming everyone means well. They don't. This is still hard for me. And it actually helps me to know that there are people who have brain miswirings that are causing this. Because I, you know, I don't want to believe that, but I... I I have to acknowledge. I I cannot understand why you don't (laughs) want to believe that. Like, it's not a matter of, in my mind, it's not a matter of wanting or not wanting. It is what it is. Like, I don't want or not want to see it. I am just seeing what is. So I do not understand how people want to see something that is not there rather than see the truth. Well, I'm just thinking, do little souls come into this world just corrupt and just broken? And that seems hard for me to wrap my brain around until I recognize that this is... This is an illness, just like anything else, and you're not the cure. Yeah, I guess. I'm thinking of small children. I don't want to just think that, well, that one's, that one's, give up on that one. You know, that's hard for me as an empath, highly sensitive. Okay, okay. Before you, your (laughs) compassion just rolls right away with you. (laughs) How many children energy vampires are you interacting with on a daily basis? No, but we're talking about if they're born. That's just, that's where my brain is going. Yeah, but they're full grown adults now. So I feel like we don't need to be so concerned with the little children they used to be. Right, but that's, I'm telling you how an empath thinks. Okay, and I'm telling which you is, how... This person couldn't have always been like this. So something must have happened. I know. And that's the thing that needs healing and fixing. But we're saying that is not true. Yes, this is what I'm telling you. So know that there is science behind this to prove that they are just wired differently. They do not mean well. Oh, this is very hard for me. <laughs> because... So uh, take a good look at yourself and assess your own vulnerability to okay. manipulation. So I'm going to read out. I recognize I am vulnerable. I've tried to yeah, do things well, to be I'm gonna quiz more you on discerning. This. So here's a list of characters' traits she's come up with that make you vulnerable to being preyed upon, okay? Okay. So you have to assess your own risk factor so that you understand that, yeah, you might be the person, you might have to own up to the fact that this is me. Some of you might not want to admit it. Some of you might be readily willing to admit it. Okay. Um, Extroversion and excitement seeking. Do you find that you often get into relationships with people who are extroverted and exciting? Does the idea of being in a comfortable relationship seem boring to you? Um. If you deny that your your answer to this, I'm going to yell at you because (laughs) you have told me so many times, I don't want to be with someone who's boring. I like (laughs) exciting people. You have said this to me. Yes, I have. Okay. I have. Because her face was was acting like she was going to deny it. I mean, not so much excitement. I don't like too much excitement. Uh, Okay. But you you cannot (laughs) deny this. No, I won't. Okay. Relationship investment. Do you give great emotional, spiritual, physical, and financial investments to all your relationships, not just your intimate ones? Do you often feel as if you're giving 80% while the other people only give 20? Yeah, I felt that way for sure. Okay. Attachment. Do you have the capacity 
for deep emotional bonds? Do you form powerful bonds with people quickly? Do you form bonds that make you feel beholden or desirous to do anything asked by the other people in your relationships? Are you actually quizzing me? Yes, I want you to answer these questions. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Competitive. Less so in the giving, over giving now, but previously, yeah. Very true. Competitiveness. Are you unlikely to run out on relationships? Very true. Yeah. <laughs> like you stand your ground and you fight for them to continue whether or Super not you Super loyal to a fault. Yeah. Low harm avoidance. Do you assume that you will not get hurt? Do you assume or do you see others as you see yourself and assume they must feel the same way as you do? Used to. Yes. Yeah. Uh, have been have been <laughs> kicked too many times to keep thinking that. But yes. I might have been one of the people who kicked her ass on that. <laughs> um, cooperation. Are you the can-do person who rolls up your sleeves enthusiastically when there's a task to be done? Eh. Well, like, you're willing to help people sure. and uplift yes, people is I what am. she's asking. <laughs> Cooperative. Like, you're not... Yes, very right. much. Um, hyper-empathy. Can you literally feel the feelings of others and cry at the drop of a hat? Yeah. Yeah. Or you work in the healing professions, which we do. <laughs> Here we are. <laughs> Responsibility and resourcefulness. Are you the go-to person in your family or at work? The one who holds the tribal memory of the place? Yep. Yeah. Self-directed. Are you a self-starter who works well without supervision? Are you highly motivated to learn new things and figure things out? I mean, I'm an entrepreneur, so I think the answer yeah. is yes. Overachieving. Have you ever been called an overachiever? It's been a long time. <laughs> but you used to be. <laughs> yeah, in school, I was definitely. Um, naivete. Yeah. Do you believe that people <laughs> can't possibly be as cunning, devious, and evil as your gut tells you that they are? Yeah. Did I yeah. just say yes to all of those? Yeah. yeah. Well, no, there's more. Conscientiousness. Are you harder on yourself than everyone else? Do you give manipulators the benefit of the doubt? I give everyone the benefit of the doubt. Well, there you go. Yeah. Low self-esteem and low conf self-confidence. Do you doubt that your needs and desires are legitimate? Do you have what it takes to face conflicts directly and effectively? Do you back down at the first sight of conflict and concede to the other person? I'm getting a lot better about that. And the last one. That was a yes to the <laughs> one. No. Intellectualization. Do you always try to understand and explain the behavior of others rationally and logically? Yes. You just answered 100% of those yes, which is why you have attracted an absurd amount of energy vampires in the course of your life and in the time I've known I'm you. I'm surprised I actually haven't attracted more given that yeah. I said yes to all of those. But I will yeah. say, you know, I've learned from them and I hope that this awareness helps you guys learn so that you don't keep repeating these kinds of relationships anymore. I actually just told Rachel when I was thinking about this whole book, I was thinking through every single relationship in my life and I don't think I have an energy vampire in my life at this mo moment. But and it's I don't taken think I have, a lot oh, of work to get to the point. It's taken probably my whole life. But you have none, yeah. But I don't have any in my More life than now. 30 years. <laughs> so it is possible to get to a point, even if you answer yes mm -hmm. to every single one of those questions we just asked you, you can still, you can still eliminate these kinds of relationships. So now we want you to make a list of potential energy vampires in your life. This might be people very close to you. That's kind of scary, I know, but you got to become aware first before yeah. anything can change. You have to recognize this person, I believe, might be an energy vampire. So I've, we want you to make a list. You probably have more than one. I've coached people whose parents are energy vampires, right? Yeah. You know, that's hard. That's really hard. But it doesn't pay for you to keep denying and burying your head in the sand. So the only way you can move on is if you first admit, A, that there's a problem, and B, who the problem people are in your life so that you can institute some change. So first, you got you to gotta make that list. Yes. And then, this is going to be so hard for you guys, I know. You have to give up on that vampire. Yeah. You have to assume from here on out, they will not change. Yep. And you have to stop trying to help them change. Stop torturing yourself with what their potential could be. Yeah. Or, right, um, I had a friend who, I'm not sure if her mom is a legitimate energy vampire, but I think she might have vampiric tendencies. Mm. And she said, once I just accepted that my mom was the way that she was, and I, and I stopped hoping for a better relationship with her, as hard as that was, my life got so much easier because it wasn't like constantly waiting on her to be better than she could be. It was like I was constantly hoping for more and being disappointed over and over and over again. And now 
I'm not disappointed because I'm just accepting that this is just the way she is and I can have a relationship with her and it might never be the relationship I ideally want in my imagination, but I can have that type of relationship with other people in my life. I don't have to get it from my mom. And that's freeing. Yeah, it is. So, okay. Give up on them does not necessarily mean cutting them out of your life entirely. No, it might. (laughs) So honestly, she said that is the ideal. Like that's the hallmark because again, they're never going to stop draining your resources and trying to feed off of you. And so if it's possible to cut them out of your life, that is the ideal. Though we understand that you can't necessarily just cut people like your siblings or your family, your parents, your the coworker who you have no power to fire out of your life. So in that case... You need really strong boundaries. Well, yes. If you're going to continue to have a relationship with them, yes. you need strong boundaries. She gives a lot of examples about how you can interact with them in a way that will make them less likely to steal your energy. One that's coming to mind is be as boring as possible. I loved this one. Yeah. If you have an energy vampire who's coming to you with, oh my gosh, all their chaos and their sob story and their drama and I need this and I'm, oh my gosh, please, yeah, whatever. Just don't you feed just, the drama by asking yeah, about it. You just are as boring. Oh, I'm sorry that happened to you. Okay. You just like yeah. be a rock, basically. Just be, yeah, be a rock, be a robot. And they don't have, they're going to go somewhere else for their supply because you're, you're not, not giving them you're anything. You're feeding into the drama. So you're not cutting them out, but you're also not giving them your energy and attention. Right. So they're not going to be interested. They're going to move on yeah. quite quickly. Other forms of boundaries, especially with people whose family are energy vampires and who they have a hard time. I mean, I've just, I've coached so many people around this in some way or another, include, you don't have to answer the phone every time that person calls. <laughs> you don't have to feel guilty because... You set boundaries around when you will and will not talk to someone. And here's a good example. If you're talking to a vampire and they go off into some sort of melodramatic tailspin or whatever, you're allowed to set boundaries around what you are and are not willing to talk about. You're allowed to say, I'm not willing to go there with you. And if you can't respect that, I will be ending this conversation. And then when they disrespect it, you end the conversation and you walk away. You hang up on them if need be. That's the thing about boundaries. You have to enforce them. You have to enforce them. Yes. So boundaries can come in so many different shapes and sizes. We could have an entire podcast episode just about boundaries boundaries. and what they mean and how they can show up. But I mean, the book has some good examples. We've talked about this in other episodes as well, particularly with people. I think we talked about it in our people pleasing episode, which we will obviously link to because that is really important. Do you have any examples of people setting boundaries that you can think of? I mean, I probably shouldn't put you on the spot like this. Well, but I just think it's really important for people to understand what what boundaries mean. Well, I, yeah, I'm thinking of a lot of times energy vampires will ask things of you, big asks. They'll say, can you drop everything and come pick me up at the airport at 2 a.m.? Or can you, right. you know, things that will drain oh, a lot of your energy. That, that reminds me of something. I have a client, I'm, again, I don't know that her dad is an energy vampire, but from the way I've heard him talked about, I would say there's certainly a tendency And he'll just decide when he comes to visit her when he shows up. And he will sometimes show up like in the middle of the night and expect her to just wake up and let him in regardless of when he shows up. So the boundary there is no. You say no. Uh, That's that's the biggest example I'm thinking of. These are the hours you are, I am am able to welcome you into my home. It's from this hour to this hour. If you cannot abide by that, you can show up in the middle of the night and you can sleep in your car until I decide to let you in in the morning. Or you can go to a hotel or you can, there's plenty of other options for what you could do. You do not have to. I'm not responsible for when you arrive, but I I can set boundaries around that. Now, here's the challenge of saying no to an energy vampire. They will probably have a very dramatic reaction. Of course, they have a dramatic reaction to almost everything. Exactly. So they came to you for a hit of energy and you flat out said no. They are not going to be pleased about that. And it's going to take a lot of your own courage to hold fast because here's what happens. If you say no to an energy vampire and they convince you to change your mind. You've just I, taught them a really valuable lesson about what they have to do to get your energy. Yes. Which is be even more <laughs> annoying and hard pressed than they were before. So you are doing both of you a service by saying no and sticking to your no, even in the middle of their temper tantrum. So you will feel very uncomfortable in setting boundaries. If you think that you have to feel comfortable before you set a boundary, you're setting a boundary wrong (laughs) because (laughs) boundaries are uncomfortable. That's part of the deal in stretching yourself and advocating for yourself. But you can start small. You don't have to start with the biggest things. You can say, no, I'm not able to talk to you after nine o'clock at night. Yeah. Just a small thing. 
Okay, one other thing, though, I do want to say about boundaries is that when a vampire loses their crap and you feel bad, it's going to feel like you're not getting their approval. You're not getting their acceptance. It's going to kind of reopen that wound. And I'm going to tell you this. I don't believe a vampire is actually capable of filling the wound that you want filled. They can't. They don't have the ability to give you the love and the acceptance that you are craving. They can't. So, they, they're, they're not interested in you enough right. to be able to give you love and acceptance. Not in the unconditional way that you're craving. So when you're afraid to set a boundary because you're afraid they won't like you, guess what? They're already not capable of giving you what you want. So there ain't no problem in setting a boundary because they're not capable. Like whatever you're afraid of missing out on with them, you can't get any way from them. Yeah. That's the sad truth. Yes. In addition to creating boundaries, I think related but slightly different is you have to get very good at saying no, which means when someone asks you to do something, I don't even think this is just energy vampires. I think this is just in your life. You have to get good at not immediately saying yes to every request that is made of you. If that means building in a pause where you say, let me get back to you on that, or I need to check my calendar, that will suffice. If you can't just say outright no in the moment, that's fine. There's going to be guilt at saying no to people. Yeah, you can't. You you feel too much. You're going to feel the disappointment of the other person when you say no. And that's you have to get okay with sometimes disappointing people. Also, go back and listen to our People Pleasing podcast because we talk about that a lot. Also, our episode about negotiation with Devin Smiley from last week because... That was a lot about learning how to ask for what you want and building up to the ability to advocate for yourself. And saying no is just one way of advocating for yourself. One other thing that she says that I think is really interesting about like being your own advocate first and stop putting everyone else first is she, she has something called the Pledge of Allegiance to yourself. Because I think the problem with empaths and highly sensitives is often your allegiance is to everyone else first but yourself. And so in order to heal your relationship with an energy vampire or cut energy vampires out of your life, you have to go back and realize that you owe your loyalty first and foremost to you and that that is not a selfish thing to do. So she has a little pledge of allegiance in the book that says, I pledge allegiance to myself and to my soul for which I stand. I honor my goodness, my gifts, and my talents. I commit to remaining loyal to myself from this moment forward for all of my days, which I really like as a daily kind of a mantra. Okay, and then there's one... One last point we want to make about dealing with vampires before we move on specifically to the healing part, which is that a lot of the time, if you're the kind of person who attracts unhealthy attachments, you're not going to be the type of person who attracts healthy attachments. You might be invisible to people who are healthy and not at all like an energy vampire. Well, and plus what happens is that these energy vampires, when they get a a source of their energy, like an addict, they will try to keep you all to themselves. So they will very often try to isolate you from people in your life. And they might talk bad about people in your life so that you'll start to separate yourself from them. And not only are you having trouble making healthy attachments in the first place because of this tendency, but the vampire might be discouraging you from doing that. So that person might be the most important person in your life or the person with which you have the most intense, strong relationship. And so now that we're asking you to take a step away from your relationships with vampires, you might be thinking, who do I have left? I'm going to be kind of lonely. I don't really have that many other people who I have strong relationships with. And that can be really scary. And I want you to to know that it's going to take courage to be able to step away from a vampire relationship and start to build healthier new relationships. And there's going to be this in-between period where you might feel a little bit lonely. And that's a normal part of this. That's okay. That does not mean you're doing it wrong. It just means you're in a transitional period from moving away from unhealthy relationships and allowing yourself to step more into healthy, balanced relationships. And that just might take a little time. It's okay to be a little bit lonely in the in-between. It's okay. So, okay. There's a a depth of work that needs to be done if you want to heal from an energy vampire relationship because, in my mind, healing from an energy vampire relationship is actually more just healing the deepest wounds within yourself that are causing you to be prey for people like that. So it has nothing to do with the energy vampire, really. It has to do with healing 
your own deeper inner wounds. So one of the biggest points of healing has to be reestablishing your own self-trust and getting in touch with your own intuition. So this can be hard if you've cut off your intuition entirely and you're only now learning how to discern again. So she recommends having a couple ideas she has is one, have a reality check friend, someone who does have good discernment, who you trust and who is definitely not an energy vampire, who can help you assess situations if you don't totally trust yourself to do it. They can help you see red flags when you're not seeing them. They can help remind you of your own worth when someone else is making you feel crazy. Rachel has been my reality check friend, for sure. It is very helpful. She only said that because she knows I'd be really pissed if I didn't get credit for it. (laughs) Well, it's also true. (laughs) (laughs) It also does help to keep a gut instincts journal or an intuition journal. So when you have those moments of intuition, you might be very quick to move on and try to rationalize them. them away. But if you can jot them down in the moments that you have them, then later on, you can look back and say, oh, I was actually really right about that. And it will help you trust your intuition more and just create more self-trust in general. Also, therapy is your friend here. Yeah. (laughs) A good therapist is going to be valuable immeasurably if you have been in one of these relationships. Even more than coaching, I got to be honest, because, because this is deeper usually childhood oriented or yes. childhood started things. Yeah. Though you need to find a therapist who's immune to narcissists because not all therapists are good. Not all therapists are actually savvy or intuitive. Just like all professions. Right. I mean, there's a gamut and some of them aren't going to be able to recognize a narcissist or an energy vampire when they see one. So they're going to be taken in by the charm. Especially if you are... And the lies, right? If you are going to therapy with your energy vampire, if it's your spouse, if it's someone in your family... And they are at all a part of your sessions. And you are with a therapist who's not savvy to this. Remember, these people are very charming. They might charm your therapist and get them on their side. Yeah. So you need somebody who's very specialized in understanding these traits. And you can ask those questions before you get started. You can say, I think I have an energy vampire in my life. And I want to make sure that you're aware of what this is. So related to that, and definitely something you can work work on in therapy is reparenting your inner child. This is an episode, we actually had an episode about this two weeks ago. It's a side chat. We will link to that as well. Because this is where so much of the compulsion to please and to get approval and to see the good in everyone and wanting to be loved and all of that comes from that makes you such prey to an energy vampire is this wounded child within you that is trying to get the love and acceptance from people around them that they just can't get. And they're in pain and they're seeking out that acceptance from everyone else when really what they need is you to go back in as the adult and give them that acceptance so that they don't need to go get it from everyone else and make themselves vulnerable to people who would take advantage of them. Also, you're going to have to get uncomfortable with... (laughs) Get comfortable, not uncomfortable. (laughs) Get comfortable with ugly emotions which means respecting the shadow side of you, the darker side, the negative, sorrowful, jealous, angry, grieved parts of yourself that you don't like to spend a lot of time on because you're a sensitive person and you really feel those things so deeply and it feels really awful. And so it's very, and you also want to see the good in everything. So you want to switch right right into the light, the light and the love, but you can't ignore this shadow side because that is where... That is where you can get preyed upon. That's where your vulnerabilities lie. And it's, you got to get comfortable with feeling negative stuff sometimes. We had another episode last month about glossing over your negative stuff with positive bullshit. And I'll link to that too. You can tell we like to talk about similar things because it's all related and we're all, and a lot of us are suffering from these. So you can kind of see how we've built, apparently we've built up to being able to talk about this because every other podcast we've had before has <laughs> fed into this conversation. Well, and the fact that so many people related to our previous ones means we know that you are struggling with this. Some of you are certainly stuff. struggling with this. And the last point we're going to make is caring for your physical and energetic well-being in a holistic sense. So... It's not enough to just set boundaries and say no. If your body is depleted, then you're running on empty, which means you might not be making very good decisions. You might be so exhausted that you can't set boundaries because you just can't even lift a finger, right? It all 
feeds into each other. So taking really excellent care of yourself is really important in a holistic sense. And she makes a good point that highly sensitive people tend to respond really well to energetic healing and often don't even respond as well to conventional medicine. And that we, because we're so sensitive, we respond well to other sensitive forms of healing like homeopathy, flower essences, acupuncture, massage, herbs, prayer, yoga, Pilates, chiropractic, meditation, all of that. A lot of the people in those spheres are highly sensitive people and that's why they're attracted to it. That's why it works so well on them. And it's a way of you prioritizing your own energy yeah, so that you can recoup your energy if a vampire has been preying on you. So, okay, at the end of this book, we, we're not even going to talk about this, but a, a large chunk of the back of this book is just a bunch of resources from her about healing and dealing and everything we've just talked about. So this book is not only just a good treasure trove of information that we just talked about, there's even more that she has to recommend in this book that I think it's a good sort of like compendium of, of where to start if you are struggling with this. This is a great place. Now, there's some parts of this book we didn't even bring up because we didn't have time. And I think there are some parts that I kind of glossed over because I was like, eh, I don't know if that matters or it didn't seem particularly important to me. And there are parts that are a little bit more woo-woo than others. Honestly, I don't think you throw the baby out with the bathwater, you know, if you don't love the idea of past lives, which she's all about and she's talking about some in this book. Who cares? It's not really relevant because everything else is. As with everything else in life, take what is relevant to you and you're allowed to leave the rest. Yeah. But the core message of this is very powerful and something that not a lot of people are talking about, but that's affecting a lot of people. So if you have a sneaking suspicion that you might have some relationships with energy vampires, I would recommend reading the whole book. And we gave you as much as we could in an hour, but I would recommend going back and she gives a lot more strategies and a lot more insight into this than we could possibly give in our summary. So remember, check out the episode description where I will link to the books that we've mentioned, the podcast episodes that are very relevant that we've also mentioned. And to get back to where we started, if you want to register for that interview series that Kristen and I are going to be a part of that starts on Tuesday and is only going to be available for three days, then you can check that out also in the episode description. So we want to hear your thoughts about this. Come share a comment, link to that. Also in the episode script, everything is just, that's where it is. Always. Yeah, we just, definitely want to hear your take on this because this is probably going to be a new subject for some of you. You've maybe never heard of this before. And I want to know how did this relate to you? Also, I just realized we're going to be recording a new Dear Rachel somewhat soon. Maybe we, we already have recorded this by this time, but if not, whatever. It's a good time to remind people that uh, you can always submit your questions to us. If this has spurred any questions or scenarios where you're like, oh my God, I'm realizing this and I don't know how to deal. We're happy to address that in an upcoming episode of Dear Rachel, our advice column. So there every to- episode that of our podcast has a link to the Dear Rachel form where you can fill out your question. And we hope you'll do that about this or any other topic that comes to mind. Yeah. So let us know in the blog comments what you thought of this. If you're like, oh my God, I am a per- I am prey. Oops. <laughs> Yeah, let me know I'm not the only who one, please. Are the, who are the energy vampires in your life that you're realizing are energy vampires? I'd love to hear that. And we will see you on, or you'll hear us on Tuesday with, I think, a blog from Kristen, but God knows what it's going to be it about. It will be a blog. And in a few sure. months, we'll be back with a new book. Yep. I don't know when, and I don't know what, but it'll be good. <laughs> you'll be surprised. Okay. See you on Tuesday. Bye.